Welcome to Healthcare Data Analytics, Patient Identification. This is Lecture A. The component, Healthcare Data Analytics, covers the topic of healthcare data analytics, which applies the use of data, statistical and quantitative analysis, and explanatory and predictive models to drive decisions and actions in healthcare. The learning objectives for this unit, patient identification, are to define the key attributes of patient identifiers, describe the challenges of duplicate and overlaid records, discuss the pros and cons of standard identifiers versus linking records, describe the methods used for patient record matching, match a sample set of patient records, and discuss the benefits and limitations of de-identified data. In this lecture, we'll talk about patient identifiers, we'll discuss duplicate and overlaid records, explain standard identifiers and record linkage methods. In the next lecture of this unit, we'll discuss the value and limitations of the identification of data. There are both benefits and risks for patient identifiers. The most important benefit is the easy linkage of records. The ability to connect records from different episodes of care and across different organizations facilitates tasks such as health information exchange. Patient identifiers also reduce errors and costs that arise from duplicate and overlaid records. What are the risks of patient identifiers? There is actually the same easy linkage of records, which potentially compromises privacy and confidentiality. We know that there are challenges with both duplicate and overlaid records. Duplicate records are when more than one record exists for patient, whereas overlaid records are when more than one patient is mapped into the same record. One study over a decade ago identified that errors in patient identifiers compromise the quality of care and can be costly, noting an expense of about $4,500 to correct duplicate patient records in an operating room and taking 325 minutes of work of those in the healthcare system. The cost was found to increase with the length of time that the error was not identified. More recently, it's been shown that duplicate records are more likely to be associated with missed abnormal test results. In one analysis of five large academic medical centers, it was found that the occurrence of patients who have the same first and last name was anywhere from 16 to 40 percent, although it was reduced when the date of birth was added. This analysis also found that these institutions have highly variable policies for how they prevent duplicate records, how they detect them, and how they remove them once they're found. These institutions also have different approaches to mitigating these errors when they do happen. What are some of the key attributes we would want in patient identifiers? These were laid out in a report by Connecting for Health published in 2005. Clearly, we want the identifier to be unique such that only one person has a particular identifier and it's not assigned to anyone else. The identifier should not be disclosing. That is, the identifier itself should be some sort of code that doesn't disclose anything personal about the individual. The identifier should be permanent so that once it's assigned to an individual, it's never reused for anyone else. The identifier should also be ubiquitous in that everyone should have one. In addition, the identifier should be canonical, so not only should they be unique in every person having a unique identifier, but each person should have only one and not multiples. Finally, the identifier should be invariable. In other words, it should not change over time. How are patient identifiers assigned in healthcare? In the U.S., patient identifiers are typically assigned at the organizational or enterprise level through a Master Patient Index, or MPI. These usually use some sort of identifier scheme that may consist of numbers and letters. This scheme may assign identifiers serially from a numbering or lettering system. Alternatively, the identifiers may be derived from one or more personal traits of an individual. Or there might be a composite, which is a combination of both. There is also usually a check digit that's used to improve accuracy in data entry transmission and retrieval. While the issue of national health identifiers is somewhat controversial in the U.S., it's actually a non-issue in most other industrialized or developed countries. For example, in New Zealand, there's a national health index. Not only is that index used for all health purposes, there's also a website that describes why that index exists, why it's important, and what the government does to protect privacy. The URL for the website is listed on the references slide.
The country of Iceland also has a national identifier, and its health sector database is the home of many genetic studies. In fact, there is also a national genetic database in Iceland. In Singapore, all citizens have a national registration identity card, and all long-term visitors get a foreign identification number. These are national numbers that are used for everything and not just healthcare. And most Western European countries also use national patient identifiers without much controversy. Should there be government-issued patient identifiers in the United States? This was actually mandated by the original HIPAA legislation back in the mid-1990s. But there was tremendous political pushback, and that requirement was postponed and eventually abandoned. Some have suggested we already have a national identifier in the United States, the Social Security number. Why don't we use it? For many years, the Veterans Administration did use the Social Security number as its patient record number. However, the U.S. Social Security number, as you'll see in a minute, is a poor identifier. So even if we desired a national health identifier, it should probably not be the Social Security number. There are a number of technical issues related to Social Security numbers. First, there are many duplicates, estimated to be up to 3 to 5 percent of all numbers. Second, when someone dies, their Social Security number is eventually recycled and assigned to someone else. There is no check digit in the Social Security number that enables a checksum process to validate a Social Security number when it's transmitted. The Social Security number is used for many other purposes, and for that reason alone, it should not be used for healthcare identification. The Social Security number has even been found to de identify individuals in public health data sources which means when you have enough different sources of information, you can actually start to identify people. Some have suggested that there be voluntary identifiers, with those agreeing to the value of a national health identifier voluntarily signing a consent form and being assigned a voluntary national health identifier. There has actually been a standard developed for this, but there has not been implementation of such a program. Others have argued that a national health identifier is unnecessary in the United States. Because it's politically infeasible, it's just, to quote Ferris, not worth the fight. There may be other ways to achieve the goal of having a national identifier, such as record linkage, which we'll talk about in a moment. But others have argued back, saying that a unique patient identifier would reduce errors and improve system interoperability in the United States. The cost of such a system would not be cheap, but would be offset by other improvements in healthcare. These same individuals argue that the risk of security breaches would not significantly increase, that most security breaches tend to be computer media that are lost or broken into. The alternative to a national identifier is the use of algorithmic matching, that is, matching algorithms that link patient records based on various attributes, such as name, address, date of birth, phone number, gender, etc. There are three major algorithmic matching approaches that are used, deterministic, fuzzy, and probabilistic. Note that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. The matching process results in a match, a possible match where there may need to be human intervention to determine whether a match is truly present or not, or a non-match. There's a trade-off between false positives and false negatives, and usually the use case prioritizes the trade-off. In the algorithmic matching process, there are a series of steps. First, the data undergoes a preparation or cleaning process. Next is the detection of errors and deviations, looking at the field comparators. This is followed by the separation of likely from unlikely matches, sometimes called blocking. Finally is the configuring of matching algorithms to classify record pairs as whether or not they reflect the same individual or entity with regards to algorithmic matching. There are also a number of data quality issues in the algorithmic matching process. Data errors take several different forms. There are phonetic errors where a word or name has multiple spoken representations, such as the name Hirsch, which may be spelled H-E-R-S-C-H, or H-I-R-S-C-H. There are also common typographical errors that occur when data is entered. As a result, there may be omitted, inserted, or transposed characters. For example, the word H-E-R may be transposed to form E-H-R, or a letter may be omitted, such as H-R. 
Finally, there may be morphological confusion from data entry with characters that have a similar appearance, such as the digit zero and the letter O, or the letter L and the letter uppercase I. Another data quality issue is that some personal traits change over time. Individuals may change their name for a variety of reasons, most commonly through marriage or divorce. Address changes as well. In a given year, about 11 to 15 percent of all Americans change their address. There are also cultural variations in how names are spelled. There may be the use of multiple family names, or there may be differences in name order. There may also be differences in the particles that are used, such as MC or MAC, DA or DE, and a variety of other variations in names. Finally, there are different formats for dates. We may use the names of months. There may be different order between year, month, and date. There may also be differences in the year, such as the use of two digits or four digits. After the data is cleaned and in as standardized a form as possible, it undergoes the field comparison process to determine whether there's a match. In deterministic matching, matching is based on rules for exact or close matching of one or more of the fields. Sometimes there is the use of fuzzy methods that allow some range of disagreement among the fields. For example, the birth may be allowed within a certain period of time, such as within several months, or there might be common variations in names, such as nicknames. There are also probabilistic methods that use string comparators for one or more fields, with some measure of similarity that has a cutoff threshold to designate whether or not there's a match. There's been a fair amount of research over the years to investigate different probabilistic matching methods, and some of these methods are used in operational situations, in particular in health information exchange. Many of these methods have relatively high levels of accuracy. The best methods are determined by the most desired attribute. For example, the process might have the highest sensitivity desired, that is, the largest number of matches. In the investigation of different approaches by Granis and colleagues, the Jero Winkler comparator was found to be the best approach for high sensitivity. However, sometimes specificity is more important because we don't want a false match. In these situations, we may look at what performs best as a combination of sensitivity and specificity. In other words, what has the best area under the sensitivity specificity curve, which measures the trade off between false negatives and false positives. For these situations, the longest common substring and the root mean square of multiple scores have given the best results. There is still research required for problems with non-standardized or dirty data, as well as missing data. A report from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT looked at the current state of patient record matching and noted that accurate patient record matching was an imperative due to issues of patient safety, care coordination, and data quality. The report noted that the current state-of-the-art record matching worked relatively well, but would benefit from standardizing patient-identifying attributes in electronic health records and other data sources. For example, having standards for the first or given, the middle or second given, and last or family names would be very useful, as would be the standardizing of suffixes, the standardizing of birth dates, and even times. It would also be helpful to use a standardized international format for current and historical addresses, including known phone numbers, and using standards to represent gender. This report also noted that there should be a process for handling changes when names, addresses, and other attributes change across the healthcare system. This concludes Lecture A of Patient Identification. In this lecture, we saw that patient identifiers, including national identifiers, have benefits and risks. Methods for linking patient records algorithmically work well, but can be challenged by data standard, data quality, and inconclusive matches.